uh, Buna Sara or hello. <laughs> Buna Sara is our Romanian. Uh, I have a huge pleasure to meet for Riala Scola. The highest we had, it was a doctorant in theology. So here we have a real doctor. We had a master before, but both of them were Romanians. Here is a world-class renowned pure doctor. We don't go lower than this this time. And I'm really surprised that he agreed. And I'm very glad that uh, Dr. Kip Tepis is with me. He, I think we may have quite common background in some ways. Uh, Dr. Kip doesn't know fully my story, but I live more or less like a Baptist, uh, kind of from age of 15, 16 till kind of age of 31. But kind of by age of 25, 26, I was in contact with more liberal Christians. And I was more or less pushed on the out of this, let's say, conservative. I was a Baptist. I would say Jesus Christ, whatever. But I was slowly pushed uh, for different reasons. For, for initially a liberal Christian, and later I became atheist, but not related with biblical problems. So maybe he has a similar story or not. Uh, so maybe you can say, first of all, something about you. You'll see, I know about Dead Sea Scrolls and Apologia. This is kind of all I kind of know. And and okay. we'll oh, thank you. Thank you, Cyprian, for thank having you. me here. Um, I uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty similar. Um, so I have a I have a PhD in religions and and um, sorry religions and theology from the University of Manchester. My specialization is in uh, uh, early Jewish literature history, uh, with a particular focus on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I grew up a Baptist, but I was like a, a Baptist from the very beginning. Um, I was uh, I yeah I. I my I grew up in a household where uh, my my parents were were heavily and deeply intricately involved in uh, in a local church. It was all I knew um, pretty much up until I, I, I ended up at university um, and pretty quickly thereafter became a much more um, progressive Christian, I guess. I, I spent most of my adult life as uh as as a, a progressive christian as a uh, as my friend uh doug from pine creek would say a flag waving phony uh christian that was for for most of my my life um yeah and uh i i spent um uh three years on a research uh contract in norway and i think it was really there that um just I guess we 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 just sort of uh, drifted away, I suppose from uh, from faith. But uh, yeah, it's very uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, and I'm yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation. I'm really looking forward to this. Right. So one part which uh, it's also based on my background. So my background was more scientific, as my family was more into research and so on. But, uh, and there is a difference between us. I don't have a doctorate. So you have a doctorate, I don't. And I, I really consider, yeah. So when I was reading the Bible, you know, you are encouraged to have a very literalist reading. And uh, I was going through scriptures and you get into the rules of kosher or kosher. I, sorry if I misspeak words with Jewish origin. But there is this very interesting thing that you find like uh, bats are birds. Uh, rabbits chew card, uh, something like that. And to me, I, I was kind of 16 and I said, there is no way in the Bible it's written and it's correct. Rabbits chew card. It's, it's impossible, really. Cows chew card, but not goats, whatever. Not. And to me, I, I got, as you are very familiar, probably you, there, are, there were a lot of booklets of ap apologetics, how to resolve that issue. And uh, every time when you saw this uh, apologetics, at least to me, even I was 16, 17, I said, it makes no sense. And the first time when I kind of kind of got more sense of it, it was that uh, I was start to learn more about how Bible was constructed, how Jewish understand the Bible. And uh, there was one book, maybe you heard, maybe not. It was named The 70 Faces of uh, Reading Torah. It was written over by a rabbi. 
but uh, what it would say that the rabbit it was in fact a metaphor for the queen of babylon that she was a symbol mm -hmm. of fertility and uh, the she's an unclean animal because she was part of the babylonian uh, class political class so this was a metaphor of the criticism of the babylonian exile do you think it makes sense is it um well i, I mean that's I, I don't a know very... if this was my <laughs> i don't know if it's right it this was... is a new one but it made the and, first time uh... which made some sense to me but right that is still cut the never yeah. So I, yeah, that's not one I've heard. Um, and I think, you know, from a, from a modern uh, position uh, based on just how we, uh, how we read texts, how we understand um, history. Uh, I think even from a, from a fairly um, Protestant Christian perspective of, of uh, reading and interpreting the biblical texts, it, you know, it doesn't work. Um, but that's not to say that it's it's um, a, a bad explanation. And my reason for suggesting that is because this is very much um, in line with how um, the early Jews uh, read their scriptures and what they what they did um, with their scriptural text. This is this is how the uh, the early Christians uh, handled their scriptures and used them as uh, as a vehicle for pointing to jesus as the predicted messiah and for um um demonstrating uh his his viability through the fulfillment of old testament prophecies so uh, there's a there's a biblical scholar by the name of uh james kugel he used to teach at uh, at harvard university he's he's long since retired but um he uh put together these are these are unspoken rules but they're they're rules that we can observe just reading when you read a lot of jewish literature and i'm not i'm not just talking about jewish literature in the bible but extensive jewish literature you come to understand that um and i would include christian literature in this as well um, but you come to understand that there were principles, unspoken principles involved um, with how to read the scriptures and how to understand what they were and how to appropriately um, interpret them. And, you know, one of the one of the key ones is that the Bible is fundamentally a cryptic text. And what that means is that where it says a it often means b so it can mean something completely different from what it says on the face of it um so the the early jews would very very carefully painstakingly deconstruct their texts completely ignoring their original context in an effort to to derive new meaning so this uh, this idea of uh, of this being um, an allegory or or a a, a visual picture of um, the Queen of Babylon, yeah, this this fits right in within the milieu and within the the perspective of what the early Jews were doing with their scriptures. Of course, on the face of it, in its original context, it you know to us it looks like nonsense. Right, but it made more sense than apologetics. As a, okay, so uh, and actually, I'll be honest with you. I think um, you know my criticism of uh, of Christian apologetics, in particular, is that it doesn't it doesn't take this kind of thing seriously enough, and I fear that too often uh, the explanations that uh, that Christian apologists will derive for problematic uh seemingly problematic texts in uh in scripture tend to be especially ad hoc in large part because they're trying to cram them into um i guess a worldview and a hermeneutic that just simply does not work so i mean i i often think the the christian apologists would be much better off taking a, a more allegorical approach to the text
Uh, and it's you know it's it's right within their own uh, their own heritage too. This is this is where the New Testament had its beginnings was in these allegorical um, unpackings of the Old Testament. As we talk about uh, al allegory, one part which, as far as I know, and you can correct me, you are the expert here. I would say. I noticed that uh, the Old Testament is full of poetry. I know especially, of course, the Psalms, obviously it's poetry. But even the Torah, the Torah, depending on the tra translation, uh, some of, I know in English is NIV. I, I don't know all the others because I'm not an English speaker. I know in the Romanian, no uh, translation of the Torah shows the poems. Maybe there is one made in 2015 or newer. I they don't follow it. these recent versions. But also, for example, you can see it uh, in, in Job. And again, in Romanian, you'll never see it like the poetry. But what is very interesting, mm -hmm. especially if you read, let's say, NIV, you'll see like uh, the Job talks in poetry, God talks in poetry, the friends talk in poetry, and they use the same length of the, the lyrics to say so the verse. So it looks to me, it's kind of the same author. Could it be, first of all, a kind of historical event if every person talks with the same rhyme? Is it this, uh, the job and the Torah clearly uh, as poetry? How do you think? I mean, how do you know? Um, well, I, I, I certainly think that you're on the you're on the right track and we have to get away even even from a um, I think a, a more strongly literalistic perspective or, or fundamentalistic perspective we need to get away from this this idea that um, that the biblical text is is a, a a collection of of documented history and what I'm you know what I mean by that is there's not somebody there's very clearly not somebody sitting on the sidelines and and just recording what's happening in the moment that it's happening um and i, I you know i think you touch on a uh, on a pretty important point that that is too often ignored and that is that regardless of what your perspective of the text is you must acknowledge that these are uh even even if we're going to provide some his, some sense of historicity to the events behind the text, you have to acknowledge that they are removed. The the actual writing is removed in time and in space. And you know d there are varying understandings of how far removed it is. I mean, I I'm I'm of the opinion that that with regards to the Old Testament, this is um, you know the. We're, we're talking hundreds of years most of the time and in the event of uh, in, with regards to the old testament most of this stuff is is properly uh fiction or very heavily fictionalized um recollections of of historical events so i mean i just i just recently um just uh a week ago uh, finished and published a, a new video about the Tower of Babel, um, which I think you can the, you can trace the story of that. the The Tower of Babel is is a myth, um, clearly, and it's a myth intended to to uh, teach about origins. It's it's uh, its purpose is 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 to um, explain the introduction you know the 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 reason why there's there's so many different languages so many different cultures how did this happen um but couched within there is also a uh, a story couched within this story is also a reflection on um the time and the place in which it was written which i believe was was the uh, city of babylon and during the um pro the the first exile so this is you know between um 597 and about 587 bce and and the focus of the story is on nebuchadnezzar and on his building program and very specifically on his renovations of uh the enormous um temple complex known as itemenenki 
So yes, there is a like there's a historical grounding there of sorts. You can trace several of these texts back to an historical grounding, but most often these are these are not written um, in an effort to to convey history and reality in the same sense that we understand it as um, modern people. And in uh, you know, in many respects, it's unfair to put these exp these sorts of expectations on on these texts just because the the people who wrote them had very different expectations and they had different needs and and the text served very different functions i don't actually think in its original setting something like the book of job was read and understood by the first readers and the first hearers to be a uh an historical reflection um, you know, I don't know a lot about uh, the book of Job, but what I do know is this is this, like almost all the the books of the Old Testament, is a composite work put together of various different pieces over a longer period of time. And the uh, scholars tend to think that the historical prologue and the epilogue at the very beginning and the end of the books are are the pieces that came at the end. And that before that, there were these um, um, theophoric reflections on uh, on on the problem of suffering and and uh, um, why bad things happen to good people. Um, and you know, within its its. uh hello I'm, I'm not sure can you st still see me yeah, at least to me it looks like it interrupted can someone confirm if they can see my stream Uh, uh, okay, so for me, the stream, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> hello, hello again. Uh, yeah. This is your tribulations. For talking about job in a bad manner, it's a joke. If you so, please continue about uh, job. So you were saying there are yeah. definitely like the prologue and epilogue are put at the end. If I understood correctly, yeah. it's kind of done. Yeah, that's ten, that tends to be what scholars think, and that in its original setting, this was a moral tale. Um, you know, and and the speeches were were you know, set in fictional characters' mouths as a way of resolving um, problems and, and and as a way of uh, uh, providing a variety of perspectives on how to solve those problems. You know, it's it's not much different from from uh, what what people have been been doing very cleverly, very creatively for since the beginning of time. Uh, writing fictions as a way to uh, to explore meaning and 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 depth and truth. So, so as we are still on the subject of poetry, at least I heard again. You can correct me that, for example, Genesis one it is made in the form of poem, a poem and a liturgy too. But uh, so it's a liturgical text. It has many repetitions and so on. So it looked like a priest would use even exactly would read Genesis like a song or a liturgy, you know, as a ritual. And yeah, it, I think. Has... Yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry. No, uh, so I, I, yeah, I would say um, I, I'm gonna make us a, a clarification here because I think this is something that people often get confused by uh, when we talk when people say Genesis one is poetry. Um, it's 
it's not the same thing as what you see in the Psalms or what you see in the book of Job or in, in some of the other poetical sections of the Old Testament. So it's what's happening there is um, different. I would say it is uh, poetical um, in the sense, and I like how you described it as a liturgy. Um, it's, it's got, uh, it, it, it's got, um, repetition of formulas, um, and it, and it reads very smoothly as, as a performative piece as something that, that, that somebody would have spoken. And I think, um, you know, there's an element within, uh, Genesis one in particular that, uh, the, the text seems to be responding quite directly in many respects to something like the Babylonian creation uh, myth, uh, the Enuma Elish, which is um, a text that was read uh, ceremonially regularly. I believe it was um, it was at the New Year's festival that it was it was read and performed every single year. So it would make some sense that, um, you know, this this story of creation in Genesis one, which is pretty clearly polemicizing against the Enuma Elish, is also structured in such a way to respond liturgically to what uh, what what the Enuma Elish is doing. Um, so and and of course, when it comes when it comes to these sorts of things, you have to pro you have to make some provision for poetic license and for for um uh what's the word i'm looking for for um metaphor i guess to uh to ring true and also you have to recognize um you know the intention and the purpose behind the text to begin with was not to um provide a a scientific explanation for the beginning of the universe while i tend to think the people who wrote this and who read this did believe that this was an accurate portrayal. This was not their first concern. Their first concern was 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 to to express the superiority of Yahweh. Um, it was to um, basically demythologize um, this this combat myth. Um, that you see within the Enuma Elish, and you see echoes of it in other, um, you know, in in some of the 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 Psalms, uh, which seem to reflect this this uh, this combat myth with with Yahweh or with God at the center. Um, so these are you know, you know these are part of the the intentions of the uh, of the poem and or of the liturgy and and the a real key focus within it is on you know the sanctification of the seventh day is very very important yes i wanted to exactly to say this that exactly two parts look to me sh 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 shocking shocking is that god gets tired and it's not this the omnipotent gets tired but it simply shows the physicality which was kind of common in that time so yeah, the god so, would get tired is... because gods were getting tired at the time they would fight yeah. i think marduk would fight I forgot with whom it was this uh, demon, but uh, the other was a god, if my I uh, recollect right. Sorry, if my in Enuma Elish, uh, Marduk fought Tiamat. Yes, yeah, yes, and uh, the other was a god, and both would get tired. So the god here also gets tired. Uh, this is this not is the, actually. Yeah. I was okay. going to. Say, I was just. Um, there's a on on digital Hammurabi. There's a uh, there's a recent uh, interview with the fantastic scholar Francesca Stavrakopoulou. Uh, she just ah, right, she right. just uh, published a, a, an amazing book. Um, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what it's called now. If I it can, was about the physicality about, of that. It's all about the of physicality that. of God. And she makes this point too, that um, yeah, in in. Uh, at the on the seventh day when when you when god rests um this is not just him um sitting back and and taking stock and admiring what he's just done um he has expended energy to do it and he has to stop and catch his breath literally um 
it, the way that the language, um, the same language of of uh, of of him of cessation, uh, with the same verb occurs throughout the uh, the Hebrew Bible. You see this people stopping and having to catch their breath. So you know, with within an ancient Near Eastern perspective where the gods were much much more limited than um, than they 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 came to be in later in in later centuries. This this makes good sense. You're muted, Supreme. I can't hear you. Uh oh. <laughs> it takes I long. still can't hear you. Oh. PD. Uh, most uh, scholars will disagree with that now. That that theory is an old theory I... that has since been uh, discarded by most. So no, I don't think that's how we got Genesis or how we got. I can hear the video okay. I just couldn't hear you. That's awesome. That I, I wanted to put. And I'm uh, okay. Did you hear this uh, clip? I will finish. And it matches this question put on by Nikolai. Uh, the Torah. I do think there were editors to the Torah later. In fact, they say Moses write the Torah. Well, he didn't write his, his uh, the account of his own death, obviously, right? There were editors that came along later. But Editors can be part of the inspirational process. There's no problem with that. Okay, so what would you comment on this? Do you and it's also matching the question from the chat? Like, okay, so shall I shall I uh, answer the question first, or uh, I'll 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 answer what they, they uh, look. What they call I think on. they look. Yes, I think they look kind of matching. They're very similar, yeah. But I'll have more to say about what what Turek says. Um, okay. So, who do I think the author of the Pentateuch was? I, you know, I nobody knows. Um, it's very important to point out that virtually um, the entirety of the Pentateuch is anonymous. There is no self-identification of an author uh, throughout. Even in something like the Book of Deuteronomy, where we we have um, uh, the we have mention of uh, Moses writing these things down. Um, that's not the same thing as um, how we how how we tend to look at authorial attribution, which would be more like what you see in Paul's letters, where he starts off saying, "Hello, I'm Paul." And I'm writing this letter, or even in the uh, many of the uh, Old Testament prophetic books, where um, you have an oracle of Isaiah or an oracle of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, Ezekiel said. So um, there's nothing like that in any part of uh, of the Pentateuch. So all that to say, we don't know who the author or the authors were. Um, they were, the Pentateuch is comprised of multiple uh, sources. And this is, uh, this, this is um, consistent among scholars, regardless of, of which theory um, they adopt. And there's various ideas as to how many sources there are or where they even came from. But there's almost universal agreement that um the uh the the torah is compiled of all sorts of pre-existing source literature um so my my thought is that and and i will i'll i'll get into turk's question here in a second but i'll say that when i'm speaking publicly about uh the pentateuch i like to set it into the context of what we call the documentary hypothesis, which posits that there were four sources of the Pentateuch, uh, the Yahwist and the Elohist source um, that we can recognize in large part on the basis of the, rev the time of the revelation of Yahweh's name, of his self-disclosure of who he was. Um, and they date to probably... Some of the, the earliest elements probably go back to the 9th century BCE. Um, a huge section 
of the Torah is what's called the priestly document or, or the priestly source, which um, I would set quite a bit later in maybe as early as as the the mid seventh century or the early sixth century, but could even be as late as the um, as the fifth century. Um, so and it appears that the priestly writer was probably the first one to actually put the sources together the first time, but it didn't end there. Um, the other important source is is D or Deuteronomy, which is just the entire book of Deuteronomy, which is a, a propagandistic piece of literature um, that was composed uh, during the time of Josiah's reign and as a way of legitimating his own religious reforms. Um, so that's, I mean, and so that happened in the in in the sixth century. This is where, uh, sorry, seventh century. Uh, yes, yeah, I think it's seventh. So can, can I interrupt yeah, one thing? So, uh, sure. Uh, yes. So I want to say that you have an excellent series about the JPD, and was one of the reasons why I want to contact you because Turek uh, spin the snowball, and I said yeah. this is nonsense. Sounds to me like nonsense. And you have a, an excellent, and I want to say, please sus subscribe. Please join him on P Patreon if you can afford it. Really, he makes an amazing job and share it to your church, to your friends. It has the best, as far as I know, the best GAPD explanation series. It's I think it's four hours, five hours long. It's, it's some hours long. It's it's quite long, and it, and it's even like when I when I uh, talk about it in the videos, I you know I'm I'm pointing out this is just even this is just scratching the surface. It's it's the it's very very complex, and I think that's yeah, so part of the reason why it it tends not to gain a lot of popular traction because it's really difficult to explain um, the very many. Um, uh, points of contact that that scholars have put together as a way to track um, the sources. But getting back to Turek here, I mean, even if you don't adopt uh, JEDP or or the the documentary hypothesis, I like it because it's maybe the simplest and it and 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 maybe the cleanest. I think too, it, it, to my mind, it's it still provides probably the best explanation. Uh, for the construction of the Pentateuch, but there's other theories. Um, the a, a more popular theory in Europe is uh, what's called the supplementary hypothesis, which posits that uh, the the earliest uh, source is in the the Book of Deuteronomy, and that the other sources were developed around it as a way of supplementing what was there and, you know, came from various places and, and, and thrown in there. Um, another, another theory is the two source theory. I kind of like this one too, which uh, basically takes like the J and the E elements of the, uh, of the Pentateuch and situates them geographically. Uh, J in the Southern Kingdom, E in the Northern Kingdom, it's it's a lot more uh, complicated than that, and it you know it, it draws in uh, other other aspects that you might you might uh, you know plug into into either D or, or P. But uh, all this to say that um, whether I mean there there has been a lot of movement away from JEDP or the documentary hypothesis in certain uh, circles predominantly in Europe, not so much in North America. But even, uh, even there, um, these theories are not anywhere closer to a traditional view of the Torah. If anything, the su like the supplementary hypothesis doesn't think that there's anything before the 6th century. Nothing. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's even worse for the apologists than uh, than than the documentary hypothesis. So I, I get it is annoying to constantly hear how you know the documentary hypothesis is 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 going out of style or it's been debunked or you know scholars are abandoning it. You know, and and while there's a 
a small kernel of truth to that. I think it's grossly exaggerated. Anytime you go to university and you take a course in the Old Testament, like, like that, you know, is is taught from an from an historical critical perspective, you have to deal with the documentary hypothesis. Um, and that is because it still has currency. There are still many scholars who um, continue to promote it. And in large part, just because the, the even though we have new theories, not everybody is as convinced of those as, uh, as others. So yeah, there's, there's, there's ongoing lively discussions within Old Testament studies about what the sources are and where they came from. There's universal agreement that there were sources behind the Pentateuch, and there's pretty much universal agreement that nothing dates back to the Bronze Age. Right, and uh, I, I remember that this is a bit uh, complementary, as you say, with the Moses. I, I know why Moses could not write the Torah. It was that uh, after this uh, Joshua, came and freed the canon, according to the tradition. But still, I think 100 later, the Battle of Kadesh happened and the Egyptian Empire didn't even get the memo that the territory was free, supposedly. I'm not sure if you know this Battle of Kadesh, the context. So I think the dating of Moses is around 1200 years BC and the Battle of Kadesh is around 100 years after right. Moses. Yeah. And it was between the Egyptian Empire and I may got it wrong, it could be either Akkadian Empire or something like that. Somewhat empire from that. But no, this, I, it think, doesn't I matter. think that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I know the history is not on the side of uh, traditional view, <laughs> just to say. Most, cer yes. most so, certainly uh, not. This is a question from the public. Uh, ah. Do you know the 7Q5 papyrus fragment? What's your view on it? Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, I'll just give you a, a, a little bit of background here on, um, on what the questioner is, is talking about. And I'm just, I, I got to uh, look this up to make sure I've got the, the manuscript right. Um, just give me a second. So it, there were seven caves um, in the, uh, sorry, there were, there were, um, oh, where is this? There were 11 caves uh, discovered uh, in the Judean desert in close proximity to this site called Qumran. And this is usually properly what, uh, what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Cave 7 is, um, is, a very, uh, is a very interesting uh, cave because this is the... Uh, this is the only cave where um, they discovered exclusively Greek manuscripts, and there's just a just a handful of them. Um, I wonder if he's got the if he's got the number right. But uh, I, I suspect what he's getting at here is so there's 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 a most of these fragments are very small. Um, Scholars tend to tend to think that if this was connected, <clears throat> excuse me, to the same group that wrote the Hebrew and the Aramaic manuscripts that, that that were much more extensive in some of the larger caves, then this might have been like a like an individual's own personal manuscripts that he hid away himself. Um, so. And and most of the the fragments are so small that it's it's difficult to identify any text on them. Around, I think it was around the 1980s or the 1990s, um, there was a scholar who suggested that one of these fragments, one of these very very small fragments, looked like it preserved text from uh, the Gospel of Mark. And he wrote an article about this, and suggested that um you know this provides a, a christian connection to qumran and and to the dead sea schools and maybe we have to rethink our dating of something like the gospel of mark or maybe we have to rethink our dating of you know the 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 whole collection of uh the dead sea scrolls 
Um, it's extremely problematic just because the, there's very, very little preserved there. If memory serves me correctly, I think there's only portions of four lines on a fragment. The only clear word... I'm not going to get this all right because I don't I don't have it in front of me, but I believe the only clear word is something like hotes or um, tain, which is, you know, like the word the or her or him. Um, so it's it's um, there's very, very little surviving material there in the first place to to indicate what this text is. Um, more recently, uh, a, a scholar by the name of uh, Peter Flint wrote an article that rather convincingly showed that you can also um, assign this text or align it with um, a much, much older um, Jewish document called First Enoch. Uh, First Enoch was written in Aramaic. But we also know that it was translated into Ethiopic and it was translated into Greek. So uh, he was able to show that the text on this fragment actually aligned pretty just as well with a part of uh, First Enoch, you know, and probably just had that right than it did with yes. with uh, with Mark. So um, all that to say, I'm I you know I just don't think there's enough there to say one way or the other that that this text uh is definitely you know first enoch i think it it it's a better it's much more likely that it is um i believe it was paleographically dated uh that is dating the handwriting um and i'm not very good at uh at, at greek paleography but i believe it's it's dated to the first century bc which would be far far too early um, for something like the Gospel of Mark. So it just, uh, it really does make much better uh, plausible sense that, that this, is, uh, this is not a New Testament fragment. I hope, I hope that's, uh, that's what uh, Vasily was getting at. I hope. If he will comment later, I will uh, comment. One part which I know and I notice is that when you read uh, I came from more uh, New Testament scholarship re reader I'm not a scholar as to be very clear that the, very often the New Testament authors quote the Old Testament in interesting ways you are saying even at the start that there is this reinterpretation but uh, one part which you kind of see is like uh, in Luke quotes wrongly Isaiah uh, in Luke for Matthew is very known to quote a lot of times the Old Testament in very imaginistic ways. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, so I have two questions on, on this. What is, uh, I know so Paul definitely mostly quotes Septuagint, but sometimes he had a variation of it. I heard this, but I, I, this I don't know the specifics, maybe you know or not. So first of all, there, there is this difference between all the New Testament and I know also because this is about quoting a source, you are frozen. Are you still around? Okay, so. I think we lost again. Yes. Yes, you did. Um, Okay, so we lost him. So, sorry for the technical issues. He will rejoin. I think Hello again. I I Hi, think maybe friend. I'll turn my if uh, that that might help if uh, if my uh, let's try my, it. If, uh, not no one wants strong. to see. Is that okay? Yes, to me it's perfect. So uh, all right. 
Okay, so nobody wants to look First of all, how you subscribe? I, I won't, but that's fine. Uh, we will skip it this time. So let me go back to the question between the Old Testament. Yeah, and you were Testament. talking about about um, Paul's uh, various ways of quoting. Um, yeah, so the, I know Matthew Testament. quotes wrongly the Old Testament. Luke, I'm sure it quotes wrongly the uh, Old Testament. Yeah. Paul, I know it's quotes mostly wrong, but mostly Septuagint. But I know there were one or two cases when supposedly has a difference from Septuagint. But also, I want to ask you other thing. Are this kind of uh, quoting in the passages, maybe even polemicizing, the same source, but in the Old Testament? Because I don't know this, in fact, at all. Is it in Old Testament the same procedure of quoting? I know that, for example, in the creation of, uh, okay, let's say in the flood story, there is uh, some pairs of pairs of animals which differ. But this, I think there are two sources mm -hmm. which they uh, are joined together. Is it any right. instance of one source which the author knows about it, but it's in another book in the Old Testament? Uh, maybe it isn't. Uh, so there are two that's, parts. Okay. Yeah. That's maybe tougher. Okay. So, but anyway, uh, the yeah, Old it, it Testament. Okay. So Old Testament quoted by the New Testament readers. Is it a reasonable reading which difference you know the biggest or most interesting for the public um so in terms of uh differences um you know i'd have to i'd have to look more closely at that i do know offhand i remember like 20 years ago i took a i took a um uh a graduate seminar uh, the topic of which was was precisely this. It was Paul's usage of scripture in the book of Romans. And um, in the seminar, one of the things that, that we noticed was, yeah, quite quite what you pointed out. Even though uh, um, Paul most frequently quotes from the Septuagint, he doesn't do it exclusively. Um, sometimes he'll, he'll quote from... The Hebrew text, and sometimes he would even quote from uh, Targums, which are um, Aramaic translations of the uh, of the Old Testament. So yeah, there's a there's there's quite a variety there, um, and it really seems to be the case that that the New Testament authors are making use of the most useful texts. So if you can. If you have a version that clearly promotes your um, promotes your ideas of what you're trying to convey, then you're going to use that version. Maybe the best, clearest example of this is um, is Matthew's usage of uh, of Isaiah chapter seven, where he uh, he he yeah he uses he uses the Septuagint, which uh, which uh, renders. Um, Alma, the the Hebrew word meaning young maiden, to uh, Parthenos, which means virgin. So, um, and that's you know he's doing that quite specifically um, because it it better supports what he's trying to do. So all all that to say, um, you know, I uh, specifics. Um, I'm, I'm probably not great on, on pointing out a lot of specific places, but I do have, uh, something that I think is, is quite interesting that I wanted to point out here. Um, in particular with, uh, with Matthew's usage of old Testament prophecies. So, um, scholars are almost universally agreed that, uh, the book of Isaiah, as we have, it was was is a compilation of um multiple separate works um as you know a sort of a, a an old uh form of isaiah that was written during the 8th century or the the very early 7th century and then later editions on top of that um and Mr. what we from have chapter 40, if i can ask so from so chapter it's, 40 when the language changes it's clearly changing so chapters 1 through through 39 are what scholars call first Isaiah and they date to about the 8th century 
chapters uh, 40 through, I believe it's 54, are second Isaiah, which are which scholars, which is anonymous, uh, and scholars date to uh, the Babylonian exile, and then chapters 55 uh, to 66 is uh, third Isaiah, which is dated to the post-exilic period. Now, um, and one of the interesting things too, like one of the things you'll you'll notice, and scholars will point this out, is that throughout first Isaiah, Isaiah is explicitly identified. He's self-identified. So this is a this is a case where we have actual authorial identification. None of that happens in any of second or third Isaiah. So these are properly anonymous texts. Um, and because they were appended to the book of Isaiah, this the people get the impression just at the outset that this is all Isaiah, and incorrectly so. Um, so one of the things that the the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown us is that there were individual scrolls which contained only first Isaiah or only second and third Isaiah, which is pretty exciting because this this shows us that yeah you know these weren't always together one of the interesting things that we see in the book of matthew is that i believe matthew quotes from isaiah uh six or seven times explicitly yes. and in in five of those instances he names isaiah he says this is what is you know this is what is spoken by the prophet isaiah and the thing that um, that all of these instances have in common is that the text he's quoting from is in First Isaiah. Um, but then there's one other instance where he quotes from, I believe it's from Third Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 61 or 62. And instead of naming Isaiah, he just says, this is what the prophet says. So... I mean, right away, you 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 could just say, well, he just he just you know chose not to name Isaiah in this one instance. But I, I mean, I guess that's possible. I don't see why, what reason he would have to not name Isaiah. I think a much more compelling explanation is that he's reading from a scroll, which is not which is separate from you know Isaiah proper that just contains these anonymous prophecies and because these are anonymous prophecies he doesn't have a name to attach to them um i'm going to give you another example that i think is kind of neat from uh the gospel of matthew uh there's one place in matthew where he misattributes a prophecy the prophecy is actually the from is zechariah. zechariah yes yeah he, yes. it's from zechariah he misattributes it to jeremiah it says this is what the prophet jeremiah says um, this almost scholars almost universally say this is just a mistake that he didn't know what he was doing. So he just, he just attributed this to Jeremiah. Um, but I think, and we have some evidence for this. Um, some have suggested that the, the servant songs from Isaiah, which appear in, in second Isaiah, some have suggested that, um, these were originally, uh, collected with the book of Jeremiah. We have other examples. Uh, the, the the manuscripts that I did my uh, PhD work in are called the Apocryphon of Jeremiah, which actually looks like it could be a collection of a variety of prophecies, including Jeremiah. Um, but even beyond that, we have stuff from Nahum in there. Um, we have some prophetic stuff from the Book of Psalms in there. So it, it looks like just a larger prophetic collection. Now, given what we have, you know, we, we have a, a, a terrific preserved example in, in the Bible itself. Um, I'm sure there are uh, a number of people who are unaware of this, but the, the 12 minor prophets, what we call the minor prophets, were um, from as near back as we, can, as we can figure, were always collected together in the same scroll we have examples of this from from the judean desert of you know scrolls that contained many if not all of the uh, minor prophets together so we know this there was this practice in place of putting individual prophetic books together in larger collections maybe this is what's going on when 
uh, Matthew actually misattributes a prophecy from Zechariah to Jeremiah. Maybe he's reading from a scroll that contains lots of prophetic material from Jeremiah, but also other prophets um, who may or may not be named. So uh, I would say that um, even in the way that several of the New Testament authors quote from the Old Testament provides some, you know, you have to look very carefully, but there are clues there about the shape of the biblical text and how it was uh, collected and transmitted. Uh, and lots of this is, I, I, you know, from my perspective as a biblical scholar, lots of this is, is, is really, really exciting. I fully agree, and I think it is. Will you answer a, there is this question in the public? If you have. I'm just going to read the question. How is Old yes. Testament writings preserved compared to other religious writings of the same time? Um, like, I, that's probably, I, I don't know much about other um, religious writings of the same time. I, I, I will say, I will tell you what I know um, about uh, the preservation and the transmission of the Old Testament text. So, I mean, most of the Old Testament uh, dates to uh, a prior to the battle, period, too. I think. Pardon me? Yeah, just say, you got a rebuttal from what you wrote before? Uh, you what you said yeah. before, sorry. Yeah. I don't know if that's so much. Uh, I I I think I think uh, yeah no he's right. Um, but yeah I, I I think that that aligns with the point I was making too. Um, but I uh, so most of the Old Testament dates to um, just before or you know prior to the exilic period. There's lots of other other pieces of literature, the Book of Chronicles. Uh, very clearly dates to the fourth century, uh, the books of Esther and uh, Song of Songs, um, Ecclesiastes are generally agreed to be post-exilic. The book of Daniel um, contains. Daniel, I think it's very recent. I think it's two hundred years at most. It contains portions about. that you could probably date as far back as the Persian period. But uh, but yeah, definitely, there's material in there that that dates only to the second century BCE. Um, so you know we have we have um, uh, these texts that 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 date back to at least um, 600 BCE. Quite a few, I think, are, are are probably a fair bit older. The oldest uh, copies of biblical manuscripts that we have are from. The Dead Sea Scrolls, and and there's only a handful that date as far back as the late third century BCE. Most of them date to you know around the second or the first century. So you're already talking about uh, hundreds of years removed. There is one. Um, there's there's uh, a couple of small silver amulets uh, that were discovered at uh, Katif Hanom. Um, and, uh, with Isaiah, oh, right? It was a passage from Isaiah or Psalms. I've got one of them. Yeah. Them. It's about the time, about the time of Josiah. Uh, um, so, so scholars date, date the, there, there's text, little bits of text on these silver amulets. So these are, these are ornaments that, that somebody wore, um, uh, maybe around the wreck, their neck or their wrist. Um, and uh, the 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 text that's engraved on them has been you know these these items have been dated to about the sixth century BC, uh, and the text looks very very similar to the priestly blessing. I think it's in Numbers chapter twenty three. Um, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine down upon you and give you peace. The text is not identical to what's in in Numbers, but it's very similar. So you know this. What we have on these little strips of silver are properly the oldest quote unquote copies of biblical texts that we have, but they're very, very small, they're very fragmentary, um, they're ceremonial, um, they're they're possibly um uh, what I would consider to be uh nuministic, uh and the and by that I mean they're they're you know 
probably believed to have magical properties. Um, and again, the text is not the same. It's not it's not precisely the same as what's in the book of uh, the book of Numbers. It uh, it's th there are some important textual differences. So all that to say, um, you know, we we feel pretty confident about the shape of the text of the biblical text as far back as as the the mid or late persian period but anything prior to that um is really sketchy i mean i can accept that that um what we have for example in the book of deuteronomy selections of it represent what you know was written at the time of josiah but i also must recognize that this has undergone uh numerous Revision. periods of uh revision and redaction and and careful editing uh, i would have a question which is kind of feeling mixing you can answer with this too but i know you work with dead sea scrolls as you as i said do you think that uh, the study of uh, dead sea scrolls proved more that the bible kind of was right i think it also mixes uh, with the four questions so do you think that, uh, I don't know, uh, there is this discussion between Septuagint, the Greek text versus the Masoretic text. Do you think that, let's say, first of all, King James Bibles were proven right or wrong as translations? Do you think the transmission was proven better or worse? What's the impact of okay. the scrolls? So the what are the translations what are the really, in particular? One of the really, really... Uh... One of the real, one of the 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 really fascinating things about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that um, so the 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 Septuagint is a Greek translation of uh, the Old Testament text, and there are very many places where it is dramatically different um, from Hebrew text. For example, uh, the Book of Jeremiah in the Greek version is thirty percent shorter in the hebrew version and uh it follows uh, a really dramatically different arrangement than the hebrew version so this is we have these sorts of this is the most significant one but we have these sorts of differences all you know preserved throughout um the greek translation and it was assumed for a long time that uh the greek text was just a, a corrupted text or uh you know, a um, just a bad, a bad copy, a bad translation in many places of of the Hebrew. Um, what the what we discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually a number of Hebrew copies of texts that look like uh, the Greek translations, the the Septuagint. Um, there are six copies of the Book of Jeremiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and three of them. Uh, three of them follow the arrangement and the text w which appears behind the the Greek translation in the Septuagint. So this is very exciting. We have, you know, uh, clear evidence of this this variety of different versions. Um, in many cases, the Septuagint preserves an older version. Of the Hebrew text, scholars are almost uh, unanimous uh, with regards to something like the Book of Jeremiah, that the Septuagint version is an earlier version that was then updated and expanded um, in into what we see in the Masoretic text. And one of the things, one one of the interesting um, differences between these two texts is the uh, in the Septuagint version of uh, Jeremiah, the um, the great antagonist is Egypt, um, and Babylon in the Septuagint is presented much more sympathetically. And then this changes. One of the things that the Hebrew text of of uh, the Book of Jeremiah does is it very much. Uh, uh, reinforces the criticism against Babylon. Um, it's much more, and it and it de-emphasizes lots of the the anti-Egyptian stuff. So, 
you know, it's there's there's very obviously uh, uh, some political motivations at work here, which have which have prompted these changes. But you know, this is one of the things we look at the the Septuagint and say, yeah, so this is an earlier version of the text, which was at a later point in time updated to meet you know changing needs within the community, changing ideals. So, but this is not so you can't just just because of the complicated nature of textual transmission and of uh, these texts more generally, you can't just universally accept everything in the Septuagint as superior or as even earlier. In many cases it is, but not always. Uh, in many cases, the Masoretic text actually preserves, uh, provides, you know, our, our, um, our, our best texts. In many cases, something like the Samaritan Pentateuch actually preserves our, our, our oldest or our earliest uh, versions of the text. So I, I would say it's very important to be aware that there's this uh, versional multiplicity out there, that there are these uh, multiple versions, that they are quite different from one another in many respects, and that um, they attest to um, periods of uh, editorializing and, and revision. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, there you are. Yes, sorry. I, I was muted. So, uh, in fact, I, I never noticed that it's clear that I'm not a scholar. I read Jeremiah, but only the Masoretic version as a Protestant. Oh, yeah. So, so I I never knew there is this distinction. And, uh, and it's, you know, one of the things, um, so you can actually you can actually find an English translation of the Septuagint yes, so online. Ro Romanians, they are mostly Greek Orthodox, so they are based on Septuagint. Oh, oh, okay. So you can read the Greek text. Yes, so it's very accessible oh, for Romanians. Nice. And, and, so, uh, but one of the I things, had, yes. I was going to recommend one of the really interesting exercises to do is to take a look at something like Jeremiah chapter 29, which is the so-called letter that he wrote from Jerusalem to the, uh, to the first exiles in Babylon. Um, to very set the, the, uh, the, like a translation of the Hebrew text, um, next to, uh, the Greek text and very carefully go through and compare them and look at, uh, uh it's like look at what's going Gospels, on there. You're yeah. And you're going to, so you're going to, you're going to see differences there and, uh, and they're very, very interesting. Um, and they speak a little bit to to what i was getting at here too um you know there's a there's a much more sympathetic appraisal of um you know uh babylon in the greek text as opposed to uh to the hebrew text versus mm -hmm. egypt which is yeah that one shows up less in the letter though uh, just because 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 Egypt's not there, but in that particular text in Jeremiah chapter twenty nine, it's it's really really neat. I, I would try to check it oh. really. And, uh, this is from the public. What's your view of the best scholars, Christian scholars of the Old Testament? Oh yeah, um, this is tough because I would say that um, you know most biblical scholars are are either Jews or Christians. Um, so, I mean, honestly, uh, a huge number of, of, uh, of my favorite Old Testament scholars, um, are, are, uh, are Christians. Um, I'm just trying to think off, uh, off the top of my head. Although I know, I know, um, uh, John Collins is is pretty nominal he's he's very good but uh you know i i i think he he still identifies as a christian um i i particularly was very fond of the late gary knoppers um he passed away uh a number of years back but uh but but he was he was very good um i uh i i i really like um oh let me think here. Um, I actually, I 
I, I have a, a maybe a, a an even stronger. Oh, James Vanderkam is 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 very good. Um, uh, Eugene Ulrich. Um, I probably have a, a a very strong affinity for a lot of uh, uh, Jewish uh, scholars as well. Um, uh, just uh, sorry. I'm I'm drawing a blank here at the worst time. That, that um, is that Talbot. Michael Talbot is Jewish. Michael or... Stone. Sorry. That is Talbot. Uh, I think forgot the first name. First name. That is a guy Talbot. I think is his name. Hmm. Maybe okay. David. Um. But... No, yeah, but I don't, it, I don't I, recognize but I, uh, that one offhand. But uh, maybe I mean, it's not so big. But I think he's popular. To... He was. In documentaries, that's why I'm saying I'm seeing oh, okay. this guy. All right. Um, uh, but I think by and large, um, and I, I tend, maybe I, I, I've said this before, I think, but, uh, but I don't spend a lot of time and not, none of us in the field spend much time, you know, reviewing the, uh, the faith commitments of our colleagues. So, um, I just, you know, when I, when I read good scholarship, I appreciate it. And it, you know, it doesn't, whether it's, it's from, uh, from somebody who identifies as a Christian or a Jew or, you know, as non-committal, you know, it, it doesn't, it shouldn't make a difference just so long as, uh, as the work that they are doing is, um, is really solid. Sorry. I'm just looking at my, uh, my bookshelf here um so yeah i i um you're if if you're uh if you're reading you know anything that's that's been that's been published by uh by a reputable academic publisher and you know i would include um even even uh, Christian publishers such as Zonderfen or, or Baker Academic or um, Erdman's um, or Eisenbrons, um, certainly Brill, but uh, most of that stuff is so expensive it's inaccessible. Uh, you're going to get good scholarship. So yeah, it's um, yeah. I'm I'm sorry if that's that's not a very satisfying response, but but uh, yeah. There's lots and lots and lots of really high quality Christian uh, Old Testament scholars out there. Most of them are. Uh, a question from the public. I had a version, but uh, so is it evidence that some Jews required to offer sacrifice, human sacrifice to Yahweh? And, uh -huh. uh, was it okay? To me, it reminds me of Jephthah's story. Yeah, uh, daughter of Jephthah. Yep. There are there are a number of places. There are a number, and I actually have a. Uh, I would encourage um, uh, Nikolai to go and watch. I do a um, I do a video lecture on uh, sacrifice in ancient Israel. You can find that on my channel. Um, it's part of my teaching series on um, on Israelite religion, where I I talk about various places in the Hebrew text which allude to. Um, a period of time in which uh, human sacrifice was normative. Now, I I would say that there was never a time that human sacrifice was required. Um, human sacrifice in in any context. Well, I, I mean, I don't know about the uh, the early Americas, but certainly within an ancient Near Eastern context, human sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice. Um, it was something that you had to do voluntarily. It was never something that was necessary, but um, happened as a result of just being extremely desperate. So um, it, uh, I, I like to think of, well, I think one of the better uh, real um one of the better real examples of, of an instance of human sacrifice occurs in uh, first Kings. Um, there's a story of, um, of the, uh, the King of Moab coming against um, uh, Judah 
and uh, fighting a war uh, with Judah. And then it, it starts to go badly for uh, the Moabites. So the king of Moab, very at a point of desperation, decides to offer up his son as a sacrifice because he he can tell he's looking at the the situation he can tell he's going to lose um so he he offers up uh his son as uh his firstborn son as a sacrifice to Kamosh uh the Moabite god and um and he does so because he he he's at the point where he's got no no other recourse this is this is um, you know, this is this is something he he must do. Uh, in it's his last resort, as we would say in English, and it seems to work because it says after that that um, um, you know the uh, the dread of of Kemosh came over everybody, and uh, they departed. So there's a good example of the conditions under which uh, human sacrifice would occur. I'm just going to not necessarily, I heard uh, an opinion that at some point the law for the first part. Yeah. So there's, there is a, um, there is a, there is a, a, a text in, in Exodus, which says that you should offer up the firstborn uh, of your flocks, as well as, you know, your first, your, your firstborn son, um, which would seem to indicate that, yeah, this is, uh, this is something that, that you are supposed to do. Um, I Scholars tend to take a view, as far as I understand, scholars tend to take a view of most of the legal material in the Old Testament as um, idealized and not as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like this wasn't, uh, this, this was um, the ultimate, um the ultimate expectations but with the recognition that you know nobody at any point in time actually lived up to all of these uh expectations so we tend to take uh even though the text seems to indicate quite fairly explicitly that this is something that you are supposed to do um within its cultural context i think the understanding is that this is not something that everybody did do or nobody even thought that they they needed to um just in large part because of the the enormous cost of uh of performing uh a human sacrifice in the first place but there are plenty of places throughout the hebrew bible which do reflect this mindset where um human sacrifices to Yahweh specifically are something that um, that were not discouraged, um, that seem to have been mandated in one form or another. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm also, one of the things that I, I, uh, I bring to mind too when, when speaking of human sacrifice in, um, in ancient Israel is a text from uh, Micah chapter 5. I'm actually just going to, oh, yes, of course it does come up. Okay, Micah 5. I'm just going to bring this up um, and read it here and explain. Uh, was it Micah? Sorry. Micah 6, maybe. I'm going to get this wrong. Um, yes, here it is. So I'm just I'm just going to read this. Uh, Micah chapter 6, verses 6 um, through uh, 8 says, With what shall I approach Yahweh, do homage to God on high? Shall I approach him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Would Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with myriads of streams of oil? Shall I give or shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for my sins? So this is the question. And this question presumes that these things are normative. The question is, you know, we, we recognize that these are all sacrifices that people performed. Uh, and Micah is, uh, you know, 
I, I think it's uh, it's eighth century. So um, yeah, so this this seems to and there's a progression here too. You'll notice that uh, that the value of the uh, the offering in question uh, progressively increases. Starts with burnt offerings, uh, increases to thousands of rams to you know an uncountable stream of oil to finally you know the the most the ultimate sacrifice that anybody could offer being the first one it's clear to me in uh, i spoke and you froze i think i hope not oh. I think it froze. Oh. Doctor Kip. Okay, so I think we lost again. Okay, so uh, we lost that archive. Oh, okay. Welcome back. You are very low. Yeah. That again. Uh, yeah, so. Please join with the camera. And Mike, I was really very clear to me the passage, and I wanted to confirm that to me it's as plain and as clear that it's also is the highest. It's very clear that it's from from the text. Is that and this so is even more though the, everything? But it's yeah, it's possible. I, th yes. I think it's important to point out that yes, the the passage itself, um, you know, this this this. Um, the whole passage in Micah is is yeah absolutely saying that no it's not about sacrifices it's about these other things walking humbly and and performing justice right but the point is that you know Micah's not singling out just human sacrifices he's singling out all sacrifice as a way you know and we can understand from this that you know these were all normative. These were all things that people were doing in the name of Yahweh because they were were firmly committed and believed that they were efficacious. I, I have one question, which I think it matches. Uh, it's not from the public, this is fine. So it's a variation. Like, what are about the Ten Commandments? I will start with my understanding. You may say it's wrong again. It's fine. So my understanding is that, first of all, there are multiple sets of Ten Commandments, but let's say the Exodus 20, but you can comment both on the multiple sets. I believe it there's actually, to me, did you say there's three sets? Two, I thought I think two, there might be th sorry. three. I think there might okay. be three. Um, Please correct yeah, me. Go I, ahead. But I want to, I want to comment. There's two in Exodus and there's one in Deuteronomy. Okay, I know that the Deuteronomy and Exodus 20. So yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay, but I want to say the Exodus 20. So. Very often I hear it, it's like, look, it's, first of all, is the quoting of Jesus, like love your God like yourself. It's, it's, uh, these Ten Commandments are basically a normative way to say how to live in a relation with God and with your fellow human beings. In, in my understanding, this is a wrong understanding. It's like basically God said this is the contract. It's like say, this is the common law of the land uh, this is the commandments I give to you. Was this like a contract? Like, I think it is basically the Hammurabi code of law. It is basically a rule set that the God doesn't say these are the moral laws. This is my set of laws, which is a different. You understand the legislation could be immoral or amoral sometimes. But God wants, for example, keeping Sabbath, which you may think it's moral, not moral. So was God, first of all, having a contract, was the understanding culturally of the Ten Commandments? What only Ten Commandments, the context, how you understand them? In the Jewish understanding and today's right. understanding, where people right. get it so, wrong. 
Yeah, this All is right. this is this is outside of my specialty, but I'll do my best here. Um, you're you're on the, the right track that the the proper um, cultural historical context of something like the Ten Commandments um, is within uh, the uh, is within the uh, the relationship of uh, of a vassal. Um, and and a and a ruler, uh, so a, a a ruling conquering king uh, in the ancient Near East would um, basically write up a contract with the conquered people and set on them expectations like this is uh, this is how the relationship is going to go. I'm you know ruling over you you are going to uh fulfill these requirements that i have and so long as you do i agree to offer you like basic protection uh but the moment you step out of line you know the contract is broken and um uh, and i'm you know i might i might come down and and kill you all or i might you know have to uh, have to resubdue you um but yeah bad things bad things are going to happen as a result so this is the same this is the sort of contract uh, sort of context that something like the 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 10 words um as it's uh as it's described in in hebrew this is this is the the context in which these appear and it's important to note too this is um this is a prologue to a much larger section what uh, scholars identify as the Covenant Code, which comprises, I believe, most of chapter 20 through 28. I'm not sure if that's entirely right, but uh, but there's a whole large section of, of legal material here that, that's, you know, this is just that sort in of... Exodus, uh, in Exodus, when it says you should pay, I don't know yeah. how many seal pieces of silver, things like that. Yeah, uh, it exactly. is on. So, um, but the way you know the the way that the the Ten Commandments um, present themselves uh, and are are organized, you've got the first four, I believe, are uh, are all about your relationship with with the uh, with the ruler. In this case, with Yahweh, um, they're all about your uh, your 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 um, um, direct responsibilities to him. And then the remaining six are all about, um, your, um, your duties to, to one another. And this is where, you know, uh, most of the focus from a modern perspective is set on the 10 commandments on the things like don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. Don't, um, don't covet your, your neighbor's wife, these sorts of things. Right. Um, I, I tend to find that that people, yeah, you know, uh, Jesus summarized the law, basically just dividing between these two things, honor God and, and look after your neighbor. Um, that's, a, it's a convenient summary, but it, it really does miss a lot of the nuance, in particular, as it's applied to the uh, first, first several is it the first four or um, commandments? What are they? They're uh, um, yes, for God is one. I gotta God. look at them now. Yes. So um, yes. So one God, uh, no idols. Uh, name don't take yeah. the name in vain. And the fourth yeah. is uh, Sabbath. I'm Sabbath. Uh, and then and then the fifth atheist. is to honor right. the parents. Honor the parents. So is to honor the parents. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there you've got. Um, don't the first one is don't make another image uh of anything else uh and and uh, uh idols or 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 statues or graven images of um of the gods in the ancient near east these were like these were not just representations of deities there there was a belief that that this this provided some sort of uh important special um uh, conduit of the relationship between between the human and uh the divine realm 
Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very important. Obviously it's, it's of critical importance that, that Yahweh says, don't, you know, don't make any, any graven images of other gods. And I know, um, particularly within a modern, uh, Christian context, this tends to be understood as well, you know, don't worship your television or don't worship your, uh, don't set your your free time or don't set your uh, your material goods above uh, God as if they're they're an idol. Um, but that's really that's really separating um, what's being uh, demanded within an ancient context because within the ancient context, uh, you know, God's would uh, would imbue these statues like it was it was you know it was a very important critical part of this uh, relationship but it couldn't just be anything it had to be you know these uh these images um you know the name of Yahweh is of supreme importance. And when it says you shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord your God or you will not take the name of Yahweh in vain. Uh, the the commandment here is not just, you know, you know, don't swear, like say, oh God, or oh Jesus, or oh Yahweh. Uh, by the way, I, was, I, I find it amusing when, uh, when people, I, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with, um, the, the, the most famous one I think is, uh, is Ray Comfort. Uh, the Christian apologist who who um, I, I know he's a famous in our own his, way. But... His good he does this good person test, or and one of the questions he asks people is, "Have you ever have you ever taken the name of God in vain?" And the very and the proper response to that is no, nobody ever has because no one because says the name, Yahweh. The name is Yahweh. And the other thing, too, is it's not just throw, you know, it's not just saying within the ancient context, it's not just saying the name outside of like a, a prayer or a worship context. The idea in antiquity was that names had power. So when you invoked the name of a god, you were invoking the power of the god. You were, this was you in some respects a human being had control over what a god would do because the name itself uh carried with it this power so yeah it's not just saying the name of yahweh it is invoking the name of yahweh to affect what you want it to and and that's that's really what's at stake here and then of course yeah, the uh, uh, honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy um, is is uh, it's it's part of it's part of this uh, this worship requirement, and it's it's uh, obviously something that uh, that that people don't pay much attention. I, I mean, it's not it. It's it's not even a, a commandment that uh, that that Christians most Christians would uh would take very seriously anymore since uh you know since jesus um declared yes. Yes. the sabbath free right so um yeah so i all that to say i i think i i actually had a conversation with with someone online once about this and 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 raised these points like you know you say it is often claimed that um, you know the Ten Commandments are um, the like the legal prescriptions um, that everybody is to. This is like the perfect law that everybody is to abide by. But most of it, not everybody takes seriously. The ones that people take seriously are don't steal and don't kill. You know and. I guess don't cheat on your wife, <laughs> but and even that is, is not something that uh, you know. It's it's these are not these are not uh, prescriptive laws that are written in stone for for everyone universally. Yes, and it's interesting. I, I was seeing a comment 
this is a tangent what you added on top is that the Jews were knowing that the stones themselves they were cut so technically they were kind of breaking the second commandment to not have card images and they were put as a holy in the holy of holies so it, and the god cut them so god saying don't give and it was a holy thing so just just I to say it's so, actually so i was gonna say I I, was, you know i think there's some and they there's had some cherubims tension. on the art art yes so I think, but I think there is some there is some tension preserved within the biblical text on what to do with Yahweh, uh, which is to say, what I what I mean is that um, I I think there's there's some evidence to suggest that there was a time and there were periods in the you know in the Iron Age when Yahweh was represented by an image or by a statue, but. But that there were his wife, even. there were maybe these these factions within Israel where some people said, "Yeah, this is okay," but some said, "No, it's not." And that's one of the things that one of the things that I find most interesting uh, in the Old Testament is is like uncovering some of this uh, some of this contentious uh, language. These seeing the tension that exists between these groups of people. You see it within. You know, you you see it between different groups of priests. You know, the the Aaronic priesthood versus the Levitical priesthood. They have their own traditions. The 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 Aaronides are the ones who won out, but we still have some, you know, some echoes of of traditions from from the Levitical priests. But you you know, you see it. There's a there's a a strong, uh, or I should say, you 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 have evidence of an anti-royal uh polemic within the text but then you also have royal propaganda within the text right these things are intention so these are the sorts of things that, that fascinate me so this uh, so does my understand faith the question okay. does my faith commitment have to do with me being a scholar of the biblical text um I think, yeah, the heart of it, uh, absolutely. I started out um, studying for the ministry. Um, my intention was to go to seminary and to be a pastor, um, you know, a, a pastor in an evangelical church. Um, but even after I, even after I abandoned that as a as a career path and focused on academics, I, you know, my goal was to um, to correctly divide. The word of truth uh to to uh you know be a christian scholar i guess for for lack of a better term i expected that in fact i you know there there was a time that i you know i i um it looked like i was going to be going and uh working at a at a seminary so but it, it, that's where it started um, but I've always, and I continue to, I, I think I love the biblical text even more now, uh, that I don't believe in it than I did when I was a believer. Um, just cause it's, it, it's just really fascinating, really interesting, really amazing, uh, literature from, uh, from, from a time period that I'm, you know, I'm, and I, also I think, I think you don't take it personally. <laughs> I mean, when you see some bad message and you say, oh, how could I apologize fix this with that? Or uh, I'm yeah, not saying, I... to me, I found it fascinating that, uh, for example, I, you know, when you are kind of an evangelical field, you are encouraged to read, but not to get astray, kind of. Suppose you should read I would... and you should un say, sorry, please. Yeah, I know. I I would actually say. I mean, I get I, I get a little irritated when when people talk about having a high view of scripture, um, as one that means you know I take the text seriously. I do what it says. I read it and I and I obey. I don't think that's a high view of scripture at all. I think that's a very naive view of scripture. I think a high view of scripture is is you know understanding the text on its own terms, and really. Um, asking the difficult questions of the text not because we're skeptical of it necessarily but because we really want to understand what's going on 
And that's that's what I want to do. So and that uh, yeah, that that's and that's the biggest I, I would say that's probably the biggest difference for me uh, now compared to when I was when I started my uh, my studies. Yeah, I, I know I was as I said to you I had a you know parallel but similar path going from a stronger but I never was fully literalist but I was not born in a Baptist home lucky me to say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's, uh, one part which uh, we have today, we had a book offering, and after that we'll go back to Dr. Kip. So this book is from a friend of Dr. Kip. Uh, you can see him, please join him as he invites this person, Josh. Uh, he's from Yale, if I remember right, uh, university. And Josh Bowen? Yes, Josh Bowen. Oh, he did his he did his PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins. So he's not here. Sorry. Uh, okay, yeah. then I made a wrong That's connection. Right. Anyway, uh, on uh, if you go to Yale site on YouTube, you have the one of the best two series of introduction in Old Testament and introduction in New Testament. The one in New Testament is made by a Christian. One in Old Testament, I think, is made by a Jewish woman. Uh, and it's not because it's Jewish uh, necessarily, but I won't say that one one of the best introductions in the Old and the New Testaments in a scholar critical view, and it's introduction. So please, if you want to first step. But uh, Josh has a, a very interesting book about uh, an atheist guidebook for uh, Old Testament. So it's a great I'll share this, and it's a great book. I had the recommendation from Dr. Kip, so I will share this. He's almost finished volume two. So he should be uh, he should be done with volume two in in maybe a month, which makes it even better. So mm -hmm. for now, sadly, we have just three people uh, who participate. So we'll have the spinning book, but they're the best people to get. One of them, uh, two of them participated today. One of them is a master in theology. In fact, he's Christian, but a very liberal Christian in my view. And he was invited to the show as a speaker, just now. Uh, the others were, one of them was, the other not. So we will spin. I will spin it two times. I don't know who wins this time. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Nikolai. Uh, maybe this time you'd like to. I said this two times. Sorry, not the winner. Sorry, I said two times. Oh, oh uh, no, you're going to spin it twice. Yes, I said. Oh. So Bas <laughs> Basile, you're the winner. And he's a Christian. He's a committed Christian. Sorry, uh, Nikolai. Um, it's next a time we'll win. Yes. So. so, even even for Christians, it's a great book. Um, because what Josh is doing, what what uh, Doctor Doctor Josh Bowen is doing in that book is is providing a uh, a really solid overview of of uh, consensus scholarship on a number of. Uh, uh, difficult topics uh, within the Old Testament, so it's it's important for for atheists, Christians, and it's it's important for everyone. And and it's an awesome book. I I asked Doctor Kip to for his books. Sadly, they're not so accessible for the no, public. Very very expensive. <laughs> and expensive. And uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I have a Honda Civic secondhand. Believe me, I, I will not sell it to buy books uh, for the public, at least. Uh, I, and But um, first of all, I want doubly recommending to join Dr. Kip on his channel. He has very interesting and amazing topics, including the, as I said, the best GAPD clip ever. I could see everyone on YouTube. Maybe the, he has a sort of history of Israel and the geography and the regions. And I, I remember seeing just one or two episodes, so I didn't see them all. And it was very cool how you go with the map, the overview of the map and describing this region. Oh, my. You, you had to work my a Google lot. My Google map to overview. My Google Earth yes. overview of the whole Yeah, right. Yeah. This is really yeah. awesome, even uh, artistically and uh, also culturally. Ah, and I have one question uh, 
Still and it was gotten... not easy to do, actually. I, I know. I, I know. This is, I want to say it is, I, I know it. I, I, I spent hours plotting that out and putting it together and getting the timing right. And yeah, that was a, that was a pain in the ass. But um, yeah. So and I've, I've got pattern. a, I, the, I, I also want to just just point out that people should go and watch my um, my latest video on the on the Tower of Babel is actually the first yesterday. I think the first yesterday. proper. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, it did. It did come out yesterday. It's the first proper teaching video, like non response video that I've done in like a year. So and it, I yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I think it's just really cool. <laughs> so. Um, and I will be, uh, my next, my next project is, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, going to be, in fact, probably the next video that I, uh, I put out will be the first in my, uh, long series on, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'm really, that's excited. really awesome. I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. so you got, God bless you. Uh, thank you. Yes. So I, I have one question. Uh, maybe you heard this. There is this prophecy about the tire if it was destroyed. Uh, uh, maybe you know it. I heard it like supposedly uh, it was. I, I think it was about Nabucodonosor being destroyed. That was the prophecy. But in fact, it was supposedly later attributed to uh, Alexander the Great. The apologetics, mm -hmm. apolo apologetics. I think also the yeah, Josh so, has a clip on it. What do you think about yeah. it? Just, uh, so, I mean, I'm, I agree with Josh on this, obviously. And this is, I mean, the, the, the majority scholarly opinion on this is this is just a, this is just a, a on the face of it, an example of a failed prophecy. Ezekiel said that you know the king of Babylon would 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 come and uh, and and raise uh, the city of Tyre right to the ground, uh, and it didn't happen. Um, and you know there are a number of apologetic uh, loopholes and explanations that that you can that Christians will. Uh, we lost Dr. Kip again. Uh. So yes, we hold on. As we got the message. Mm. It's just joining. Okay. You are still kind of frozen, Doctor. Okay, so I will wait a few one minutes. Maybe he will join to put a closing statement and. Uh, if you would say about the tire prophecy, but uh, if you have any closing remarks, uh, please say them. 
and I'll be glad to put them. Welcome back again. You you are saying it's bad things awesome. about the Bible. So <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, some people some people seem to think that's that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's... Um, so uh, tire, right? Uh, yes. You know, one of, one of the things about this prophecy is is Ezekiel actually um, has to within the text. It uh, it's clear uh, later on uh, Ezekiel has to adjust the prophecy because um, it 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 didn't come to fulfillment. So I I've often said um, you know you can you can come up with halfway plausible uh, ways of reconciling these sorts of problematic uh text within the bible you can do it people do it this is what apologists do right and just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should um i would say most of the time it doesn't help us to understand what's going on in the bible it actually detracts from uh what i think is is more significant and interesting in the biblical text. And this is one of these, these instances. Yes, you can, you can provide, I think it's a bad explanation, but you can, you can provide a halfway plausible explanation for Ezekiel's prophecy of Tyre as a way to suggest that it was eventually fulfilled in Alexander the Great. Again, I think it's a bad explanation. You, but you, you can offer. I, as, I, as I want to interrupt you one thing about Alexander. Just to say one thing, which I know, I don't know if Josh was putting in the clip, but uh, I, I was watching a documentary describing the destruction of Tyre by Alexander. And Alexander the Great doesn't destroy all Tyre. In fact, no, the he king, I'm not sure. No, so it, in the prophecy says it destroys, so even Alexander doesn't. The king, if I remember right, goes into the temple uh, and hides there with some surrounding people. Many people around are killed, but even the Tyre, it says it's, everything is destroyed, no rock remains to if I remember the prophecy right. So even Alexander yeah. doesn't fulfill. No. Right. Sorry. So but again, I, I you know, you can, you can provide a, an apologetic explanation for that by saying, well, you know, it's, there's some hyperbole at work here. But, I, you know, the point is just because you can, you, you can make these things work even poorly, don't do it. You shouldn't do it. And the reason you shouldn't do it is because it's, it's, um, it it does a disservice uh, to the text. It does a disservice to the history. It does a disservice to the reality of um, of what was taking place. But um, I, and on that note, I think I I think we should. Uh, I, I'm going to have to Wrap get up. going here. So yes, I, I really appreciate a lot. You you promised to me one hour. And we are on the oh, hey. second hour. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's, you know, it probably promise. ends up being an hour with all the interruptions, right? No, it was basically no interruption. And I really appreciate and I'm really honored to see you here. And uh, please join yeah, my pleasure. His, uh, page. And maybe in one year or two years, you'll join me back if you like this talk. Be happy. And to. like Romanian public. And I really love it. Thank you. And have a nice, excellent, and award me winter and uh <laughs> close to the advance <laughs> okay bye bye thanks Dr. very much bye okay, thank you bye bye